Welcome everybody and um, good afternoon or good morning to friends joining from the US um, and thank you for joining us uh, for our annual Fox Williams data protection update and it's actually happy birthday to the GDPR which is five years old today. How time flies. Uh, my name is Nigel Miller and I'm one of the partners in our tech and data team and I'm very pleased to be joined by my colleagues Colvin Stone, Arjun Majumbar and Claire Bowler. And here's what we're going to be covering today. Uh, Claire is going to kick off with a look at some of the key changes proposed in the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill, which is currently at the committee stage going through Parliament. Arjun will then look at the highly topical and challenging area of international data transfers and some key recent developments. Um, I'm then going to take a look at current developments in respect of data protection and AI. And then Colvin will look at recent enforcement actions and uh, what we can learn from them. So although there's a lot of detail on each of these issues, within this hour, we're going to try and keep the webinar relatively high level. Um, please do submit questions on the Q&A as we go along, and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, but we do have a lot of people on the on the call and there's a lot to get through, so we may not have time to answer them all. Um, if not, we'll um, come back to you uh, following the webinar, or please do contact us afterwards, whether by email or otherwise, um, if you need any more information or help, and we'll be more than happy to respond in the coming days. Um, so this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will circulate a copy of the slides and also a link to the recording. Uh, so there's no need to try and uh, scribble notes as we go along. So uh, without more ado, first handing over to Claire, for a look at the changes proposed in the current uh, UK DPDI bill. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so on the 8th of March this year, uh, the UK government introduced a new data protection and digital information bill. And this aims to tread a careful line between the UK having its own data laws post Brexit, whilst at the same time not going so far as to irritate the EU into withdrawing the UK's adequacy status when it comes up for review in June 2025. So some of the objectives of the bill are to be more business friendly and make it less difficult and costly to implement than the GDPR as it is currently, to reduce the paperwork involved with compliance and to clarify aspects of the current law. Next slide, please. So some of the main changes are set out on that slide for you there, and we're gonna go through them uh, one by one. Next slide, please. So starting off with DSARS. So a central pillar of the GDPR is to give data subjects a large degree of control over their data by giving them a number of rights in relation to how their data is used. And one such right is that of the data subject access request, which is by far the most used and controversial of the data subject rights. Um, and the basic right is that the data subject has the right to obtain from the controller confirmation whether personal data concerning them are being processed and if so, be able to access personal data and other information. So basically you must comply with the DSAR without undue delay and at the latest within one month of receiving the request. There is an exemption to this complying with this uh, and that's where the DSAR itself is manifestly unfounded or excessive. So the bill proposes to amend this exemption so that you can refuse to respond to a DSAR or charge a fee if a DSAR is vexatious or excessive. This exemption will allow more DSARs to be refused than the existing exemption. So a request may be deemed vexatious if it is not made in good faith or is deemed an abuse of process. So an example of this is where a DSAR is um, not motivated by privacy concerns, uh, but instead is used as a pre-litigation disclosure exercise or has a mixed motive. And these may be more open to challenge and refusal than at present under the GDPR. Um, under the GDPR, as most of you, I, I presume, would already know it, you can't process data unless you have a legal basis for the processing and you have to satisfy, to satisfy at least one of the conditions for the processing to be lawful. One of these is where it's necessary to process the data uh, for a genuine and legitimate reason. So if you can say that the processing is necessary for a genuine and legitimate reason, and this is not outweighed by any potential risk or harm to the individual's rights and interests, uh, you will then have a legal basis for the processing. And this is known as the balancing test. The bill creates a new lawful ground for processing the personal data. 
allowing you to process personal data where necessary for what's known as a recognized legitimate interest. So that's processing that meets a condition in a new Annex 1 to the GDPR. This includes conditions such as preventing crime, civil emergencies, and safeguarding vulnerable individuals. And just but note, these conditions would not actually be subject to the balancing test. Whilst these might not be useful to day-to-day -day business, the, biz the bill also sets out examples of activities which fall within the legitimate interest condition. These include processing for direct marketing, intra-group transfers, and for network security. This is helpful clarification, but it's likely already the case in any event under the GDPR. Moving on to data security. So another of the key principles of the UK GDPR is that you process personal data securely by means of appropriate technical and organisational measures. This is known as the security principle. Uh, the UK GDPR does not define the security measures that you should have in place. Uh, it requires you to have a level of security that is appropriate to the risks presented by your processing. So you need to take into account when determining this factors such as the nature and extent of your organization's premises and computer systems, the number of staff you have, and any personal data held or used by a data processor acting on your behalf. The bill slightly modifies terminology in the GDPR by replacing the requirement to implement the appropriate technical and organizational measures to appropriate me measures, including technical and organizational measures. So this is potentially broader than the GDPR as it currently stands. Next slide, please. So moving on to the removal of the requirement to appoint a representative. So if you're based outside of the UK, and don't have a branch, office, or other establishment in the UK, but you either offer goods or services to individuals in the UK or monitor the behavior of individuals in the UK, you need to comply with the UK GDPR regarding this processing and to appoint a representative in the UK. So for this, you need to authorize a representative in writing to act on your behalf regarding your UK GDPR compliance and to deal with any supervisory authorities or data subjects in this respect. Uh, you don't need to appoint a representative if you're either a public authority or your processing is only occasional of low risk uh, or does not involve the large scale use of special category or criminal offence data. So what does the bill propose? The bill says um, instead says the controllers and processors who are outside the UK but who must comply with the UK GDPR because of these what's known as extraterritoriality provisions are no longer required to appoint a UK based representative, but this may still be seen as best practice. On a similar note, the UK GDPR also requires you to appoint a data protection officer if you are a public authority or body or if you carry out certain types of processing activities. And these processing activities include where your core activities require large scale, regular and systematic, systematic monitoring of individuals. So, for example, online behaviour tracking or where your core activities consist of large scale processing of special categories of data. As said, there's the exemption for the representative. And this officer must be independent and expert in data protection, adequately resourced and report to the highest management level. Uh, an officer can either be an existing employee or an externally, appoint externally appointed. Uh, the bill replaces the requirement for the DPO, but introduces a new requirement to instead designate a senior responsible individual who must be part of the organization's senior management. Next slide, please. So it's currently a legal requirement to document uh, your processing activities and it's a clear way of showing what you're doing in line with another key data protection principle, that of accountability. An organisation is therefore required to carry out information audits, also known as data mapping, to find out what personal data is held and to understand how the information flow flows through the relevant organisation. Based on this data mapping, a record of processing activities should then be created, which should be a formal, documented, comprehensive and accurate record and reviewed regularly. The bill proposes to reduce this red tape and says that a controller or processor would be exempt from the duty to keep records unless they are carrying out so-called high-risk processing activities. The ICO is set to publish guidance with examples of the type of processing which it considers are likely to um, rely on high risk. Moving on to the PC, PECRs, these regulate an organization's sending of electronic marketing messages, so that's by phone, fax, email or text, use of cookies uh, or the provision of electronic communication services to the public. Uh, a cookie is a small text file 
as many of you will know, that is downloaded onto terminal equipment. So that's a computer or a smartphone where the user accesses a website. And this allows the website to recognize that user's device and store some information about the user's preferences or past actions. So the basic rule under the PCRs is that you must tell people why the cookies are there, tell them that they are there, and then that you also have to get the person's consent to store a cookie on their device. So instead of this, Bill proposes some updates to the rules on cookies to reduce the need for these cookie consents, including those annoying cookie pop-ups. You can implement cookies for statistical purposes or for functionality or to update software without the need for consent. Meanwhile, the PCRs also um, increase the fines for nuisance calls and texts from the current 0.5 million to be in line with GDPR amounts. Uh, Nigel will also be discussing the proposed changes regarding automated decision making and AI in due course. Next slide, please. So, what are the practical considerations of this? Uh, it seems likely that the new bill will come into force during the course of this year. And it's had a second reason, it had its second reading in the Commons on the 17th of April. Some of the key points and concerns raised by the MPs included the potential risk of losing the data adequacy with the EU, as I discussed, the potential for changes to subject access requests, reducing public trust in the use of their data. Broadly speaking, most UK businesses will be able to simply continue with their current level of compliance without significant change. But for some, there will be opportunities to take advantage of following the somewhat more business friendly amended rules. However, one complexity is that many businesses are also subject to the EU GDPR as a result of the extraterritoriality provisions. They'll need to be able to demonstrate compliance with both now slightly diverging possibly regimes. For now, the bill will now will move to the public bill committee with the first all evidence sessions having been held on the 10th and 11th of May and a report due on this by the 13th of June. A compilation of these debates so far was published on the 22nd of May. So handing you back to Nigel. Thanks so much, Claire. Uh, moving straight on to Arjun to look at um, international transfers. Thanks very much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good good morning. Um, a happy fifth birthday to the to the GDPR. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, international data transfers. Um, so what I'm going to cover in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes or so is a, um, a quick summary of the law, recent developments um, and actions that you should be taking. Um, I am going to be talking a bit later on about the recent Meta decision that was handed down on Monday. And that's um, had quite big ramifications in this area. So uh, quite, a, quite a bit to cover. So um, yeah, let, let's get into it. Next slide, please. So we're probably by now all familiar with the fact that we've got um, two, two versions of the GDPR in play. So you've got the original EU GDPR, which came into force exactly five years ago. And at that time, the UK was still a member state. Uh, but then we had Brexit. And then since Brexit, the UK has retained its own version of the GDPR. Which, uh, uh, Claire has talked about the, the reforms that are currently being proposed. So when we think about restricted transfers, it's important to ask ourselves whether it's an EU GDPR restricted transfer so is the transfer outside the EEA or is it a UK GDPR restricted transfer? So a transfer outside the, the UK. Now, I'm sure most of us are aware that restricted transfers doesn't mean that there's a total ban on international data transfers. Um, otherwise, of course, international business would be massively hindered um, and the UK and EU recognize this. Uh, so restricted transfers are permitted, but only if one of the following conditions applies and uh, they're summarized on this slide. So, so the first is adequacy. So adequacy is essentially a uh, recognition that certain countries or territories um, offer the same level of protection of, um, of personal data as the GDPR. The EU has its own list of countries it has deemed adequate over the years. And because of Brexit, the UK has its own adequacy list. Um, but what the UK did after Brexit is it pretty much mirrored the EU's adequacy list. So as things stand, the EU and the UK adequacy lists um, are, are the same. Now, I'm going to come back to adequacy, particularly UK adequacy, and um, I will talk about the, the US um, on a uh, later slide. Um, so I will come back to that topic. Um, but for now, uh, suffice to say that ad adequacy is the, uh, the the easiest method for uh, a restricted transfer to be permitted, um, as there isn't anything further the data exporter is required to do. Um, however, that 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 list of adequate countries is is not very is not very long. Um, but so, so if a country um, hasn't been deemed adequate, um, then the data exporter um, has to turn to one of um, a specific set of what are called transfer tools or appropriate safeguards. 
And for the vast majority of businesses, um, the only viable appropriate safeguard, and um, this is what we're, we're, we're used to in practice, um, are the static contractual clauses or SECs. Again, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these. Um, they're essentially uh, a contract between the data exporter and the data importer uh, in a form laid down by the regulators. And that contract contains uh, clauses that cannot be amended. So they're these non-amendable um, uh, prescribed clauses that you incorpor incorporate into your contract um, between exporter and importer. Now, what's happened in recent years is that the EU have since published new uh, EU SECs. So um, those who are familiar with SECs will recall that we had old 2004 and 2010 versions under the old data privacy laws pre-GDPR. Um, we now have new EU SECs, um, but the new EU SECs were published post-Brexit. So the UK had to publish their own versions, which they did. And in March 2022, the, the ICO, the UK ICO, uh, the UK regulator brought into force a UK version called the International Data Transfer Agreement or IDTA. Um, what they also did is published a um, what we call a UK addendum, um, which uh, essentially can be used alongside. So, so the UK addendum essentially recognizes the EU SECs, um, but has the effect of sort of converting the EU SECs uh, into, uh, into UK law. So you've got this option if you're a uh, data exporter subject to UK GDPR, whether to use the uh, IDTA um, or the uh, UK addendum, or I should say the new SECs plus UK addendum combination. Now, um, there are some important deadlines with regards to when these need to be implemented, and actually most of them are passed. Um, so what, what I've done in a later slide is I've set out a, a table of key dates. We'll, we'll come back to that shortly. Um, I'll touch very briefly on this third condition, uh, where which is that certain limited derogations that you know might apply. Um, so if adequacy doesn't, doesn't apply, and for some reason you can't use SECs, you have to find um, a derogation, um, or essentially an exception listed uh, in the GDPR. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on derogations in the interest of time. Um, and also for, from our experience, they, they tend to be sort of rarely applied in practice. Um, this is because they tend to only really work for very specific or exceptional circumstances, um, sort of one-off transfers or um, sort of one-off cases. Um, they're not really designed uh, to accommodate uh, routine um, overseas transfers. So I'll now turn to transfer risk assessments. Next slide, please. So, um, Following the SHREMS 2 decision in 2020, when the Privacy Shield adequacy decision for transfers to the US was invalidated, I, I will come back to that. Um, as well as that, the European Court also looked at the um, validity of the SECs. And essentially, the court ruled that the, um, the SECs are, um, are a valid method of transfer, um, but that uh, data exporters should not rely on the um, clauses alone. Um, essentially, it's not, it's not just a tick box exercise where you just incorporate the clauses. Um, the data exporter is also required to carry out a risk assessment of the, of the transfer, hence um, a, tra a transfer risk assessment or transfer impact assessment or TRA or TIA. Now, now, now TRAs um, are required where, so, so where adequacy doesn't apply. Um, so in, assessment, in essence, where you're relying on SECs, um, and a TRA basically involves assessing the country which is receiving the data. And if there are any particular issues with that country, say due to um, intrusive government surveillance, um, surveillance laws or, or, or lack of privacy rights, um, the, the parties also need to consider putting in place um, what are called supplementary measures. So um, for example, they should consider um, data encryption, um, restricted access, um, minimization of the data that's that, that's going to that country, um, all to, to mitigate against the privacy risks that are inherent um, in, in that country. Um, the European Data Protection Board has published guidance um, on, on TRAs. The UK ICO is still sort of playing catch up, hasn't yet published guidance, um, but it has published a tool that parties can use. Um, and what the UK regulator has also done quite helpfully is it has acknowledged the European guidance is valid as well. So you've kind of got this choice between using the UK tool and the um, and the uh, European guidance um, to carry out your uh, TRAs. So the exercise is virtually the same, regardless of whether it's an EU or UK restricted transfer. And in practice, we're, we're, we're doing quite a few of these um, for, our, for our clients. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I promised I'd um, uh, provide a, a, a table of, of, of key dates. Um, so, so here we are. Um, I, I won't dwell on them too much because, um, as you can see, most of these dates and 
uh, grace periods, if we can call them, uh, have now um, expired. Um, what I've done is I've split the date, uh, split the table between EU GDPR uh, restricted transfers and UK GDPR restricted transfers um, because different dates apply. Um, I wanted to point out in particular the 27th of December 2022 date, um, which has already passed. Um, so going forward fr from that date onwards, any restricted transfers subject to EU GDPR must um, now incorporate the, the, the new EU SEC. So in practice, this means that um, data exporters subject to EU GDPR um, should have switched uh, all of their paperwork it previously incorporating older USECs over to the to the new USECs, and then a similar deadline with the UK. So from March 2024, similar to that 27th of December deadline in respect to the EU, data exporters subject to the UK GDPR uh, need to switch all of their paperwork previously incorporating older USECs to the um, either to the IDTA or the EU SECs plus. UK uh, addendum um, combination. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm going to turn to some um, key recent developments, um, and there have been some very recent developments. Um, now, the, the, the first two issues listed here, um, uh, the, the, met, the, the meta fine, and I know um, I think Colvin's going to um, talk about this as well, and the EU US data privacy framework, they're, they're actually born out of the the same overarching issue, which is all about transfers to the US, which is a, a very um, tricky and con controversial subject. Um, and essentially, as far as the EU is concerned, there have always been fundamental concerns with sending data to the US. Um, and essentially, this, it all boils down to you know, um, US government surveillance laws and US government agencies like the NSA um, having the ability to access uh, communications of um, non US citizens, um, so foreigners um, online. Um, you, you, you may recall that the Privacy Shield, so that was an adequacy de decision in respect of transfers to the US, was overturned in the Schrems 2 case in 2020. And that case concerned Facebook Island, now, now Meta Island. So since July 2020, there has been no adequacy that could permit transfers of data from the EU or UK to the US. Now, Meta, or Facebook, um, essentially did what uh, most businesses have done since the Privacy Shield was invalidated. Um, they started relying on SECs uh, for transfers of uh, data to the, in this case, to the US parent. Now, the headline news is that the Irish regulator has fined Meta a, a seismic 1.2 billion euros. Um, I know Colvin's going to talk about enforcement trends a bit later on, but the, the, the key takeaway from, a, from an international transfer perspective is that the um, the Irish regulator found that Meta's reliance on SECs infringed GDPR. Uh, essentially, this is again due to US government surveillance laws and the lack of guarantees to, to safeguard against this. Um, the Irish regulator have therefore ordered Meta to, to cease transferring personal data of EU users to the US. Now, this is huge um, because it, it, it calls into question whether any reliance on SECs is sufficient for uh, personal data transfers to the US. And of course, this affects um, any business, uh, many businesses currently, you know, relying on SECs to transfer data to the US. Um, however, it, it is worth pointing out a few things. Um, um, I, I think I think during times like these, it's it's um, it's important to be pragmatic. So, so not every organisation is a is a Meta, Facebook. Um, they they in particular have been the subject uh, of investigation for um, for at least a decade. Um, so the, the Irish regulator's decision is based on EU GDPR, so it's not a UK GDPR decision. Um, so it technically, it technically doesn't apply to, to UK transfers. The, 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 the other, the, the big point is that the, the EU and US are currently negotiating a new um, EU to US adequacy framework. Um, and this is being, uh, this, is, this is known as the data privacy framework. And so it's essentially a, a redo of the, of the old privacy shield. It's currently a draft only, but the hope is that the EU and US can come to an agreement in the next few months. Uh, and if it does, it means that data exporters subject to EU GDPR will once more be able to transfer personal data to, the U to, to US companies which are certified under that framework um, without the need for uh, additional data protection safeguards. Um, that being said, uh, Mr. Schrems, um, the data activist responsible for the for the um, the cases against Facebook um, has suggested that it, you know if, if adopted um, that you know it, it would be subject to to, to a challenge um, 
so that that new framework would be likely to be challenged as, as soon as, as soon as it's adopted. Um, so in conclusion, in the area of transfers to the US, the the um, it, it's it's far from settled, uh, and the and the saga with the, with the with the US continues and doesn't look to be ending anytime anytime soon. Um, I, I'll talk about you. Um, EU UK adequacy. Um, um, we, we have a situation where the, the UK recognizes the EU, or I should say the EEA, um, as adequate, uh, and vice versa. Uh, the EU recognizes the UK as adequate. Um, and this is all sort of uh, loosely tied to post Brexit arrangements. Um, it's almost as though we never left the EU in respect of the, the free flow of data uh, between the EU and the UK, as we have these um, mutual or uh, two-way adequacy decisions. However, that that could well change. I think um, Claire touched upon it previously. Um, if, if the UK data protection laws change too much, in other words, uh, if they're deemed by the EU to be uh, relaxed too much and steer too far away from the current GDPR, the UK does risk losing its adequacy status. Um, adequacy is obviously very important to the UK for a lot of businesses, um, obviously working closely with the EU. Uh, and the need to retain this adequacy decision may be one of the reasons why the draft bill is a maybe perhaps a little less radical than it was originally thought out to be. Um, the EU's uh, adequacy decision for the UK is set to expire in 2025, um, but the, UK, the EU does have the power to remove it sooner. Um, another, another worry for businesses is that if the UK has a more, shall we say, relaxed attitude towards countries like the US in terms of uh, sharing data with the US, then that could also be a trigger for the EU um, removing its adequacy decision for the UK for, for that reason. So again, we'll have to watch watch this space on that one. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, final slide for me. Um, actions you should take. Uh, so th These might be things um, you are doing or have done already, um, but worth bringing them up in any case. Assess your international data flows. Um, I think it's really important to, to, to map out your data flows. Um, so within your organization, you know, what, what is actually happening on a practical level? Wh where is personal data flowing? Who, who, who is it going to? If you're if you're solely, you know, if you're solely UK based and you're only processing data within the UK, then international data transfer rules are less likely to be relevant. But on the other hand, if you're a large corporate group, with entities in lots of different countries or offices in lots of different countries, then your exposure obviously is going to be much, much greater. But you can only really determine this if you, you know, by, by actually mapping out your, your data flows and figuring out where data is going. And that, and that mapping is important because it then helps legal counsel like us, um, you know, to figure out kind of what, what laws actually apply. You know, it, are we talking about UK GDPR transfers, EU GDPR transfers, um, or, or, or both? Um, and again, this will depend on the way that your, your, your business is, is set up. Are you transferring personal data to the US? Um, if you are, then of course, the implications of the recent meta decision is very important. Um, as I was saying before, that the, the saga continues. Um, I'm, I'm sure um, my other colleagues will have, have an opinion on this. Um, it, I, I don't think I'd recommend doing anything drastic as of now. Um, I think it's a case of sit tight and um, Wait, wait, wait for the outcome of the new EU US data privacy framework, which we are supposed to be receiving in the in the coming months. Um, but one recommendation I would make is, you know, um, how can you um, minimize or, or even avoid transferring data to the, to the US? You know, um, it's worth asking the question: you know, Is it is it necessary? Um, and if and if it is necessary, what what measures could you put in place um, to um, to mitigate against the risks uh, inherent with transferring data to the US? Um, for example, encrypting the data um, end to end me means that certain um, US government uh, programs can't actually access data in in transit. So it's worth getting down to that sort of practical level of um, you know what what measures could you incorporate to um, to, to mitigate against um, the risks inherent in transferring data to the US and is it is it actually necessary? Um, if you're still relying on old EU SECs, then either you should prioritise. Uh, you should be moving over to the new EU SECs, or in the case of UK transfers, um, as I said before, that you've got that March 2024 deadline to move over to the to the IDTA or UK addendum. Um, and um, again, a reminder to, um, uh, to carry out transfer risk assessments uh, if you're relying on SECs. Um, and um, if you're an international group of companies, then you should have updated uh, your um, intra-group data transfer agreement. Um, so a lot of this we are helping our clients with. Um, um, yeah, please, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, uh, okay, uh, uh, over to Nigel, who I believe is going to talk about the wonderful world of AI. 
Thanks so much, Arjun. Yeah, so we're going to switch now into another topic that's getting a lot of attention um, at this time, namely AI. Um, so I'm going to take a brief look at the EU AI regulation and also at um, GDPR aspects. Uh, so the recent emergence of ChatGPT has captured everyone's attention. Um, it's helped us to envisage the possibilities of the technology. And while we can, I think, begin to understand that AI is going to revolution, revolutionize a lot of areas, the potential is exciting. Um, this is a legal session after all, so we always have to put on a bit of a cold towel and consider the risks and the dangers. And as far as AI is concerned, notwithstanding all of the considerable benefits, there's no shortage of concerns in relation to the potential impact. Uh, at one extreme, we had uh, Elon Musk saying that AI could lead to the end of humanity as we know it. He was more measured in a recent interview when he said that AI is unlikely to annihilate humans. So uh, we should take comfort from that. So while people have legal, ethical and moral responsibility, uh, machines don't. Um, inevitably, therefore, there's a lot of calls from different quarters for the development of regulation in relation to AI, um, particularly OpenAI, which is the creator of ChatGPT, are themselves calling for regulation to help reduce what they see as an existential threat posed by the technology. Well, in terms of regulation, there is already a range of non-AI specific regulation in multiple areas that will impact on the use of AI, even though they don't specifically have AI in mind, including the GDPR, more on that in a minute, uh, the Equality Act, um, detailed sectoral regulations, for example, in financial services, IP laws and competition and markets laws. So I'm going to look briefly at the um, EU proposed AI regulation and then at some specific issues under the GDPR. So um, in April uh, 21, the European Commission took the bold step of publishing a proposal for a regulation in relation to AI. It's very lengthy, it's detailed, it's uh, over 50,000 words. Um, and actually the, the European Parliament just last month agreed on the text, so it is moving forward. And when it's passed, it will be the, fir the world's first comprehensive regulation on AI. It um, adopts what's called a risk-based approach and it categorizes AI um, as um, unacceptable risk or high risk, uh, or low or minimal risk. Um, the main thing is that certain risks that are deemed unacceptable are prohibited. Um, so these are systems that use, for example, biometric surveillance, uh, systems that exploit vulnerabilities or use subliminal techniques to distort behavior, or systems that are used for social scoring. All these are, are defined as uh, unacceptable risks and are prohibited. Um, but the main focus of the regulation is on the higher risk AI systems. Um, these are systems which are um, perhaps many of them already in use for things like credit scoring, um, in recruitment processes, um, or for making employment uh, or, or rostering decisions. High risk systems include uh, where systems pose a significant harm to people's health, safety, or their fundamental rights. Um, in relation to these high risk systems, the key requirements of the AI Act are similar in many ways to those under the GDPR. Um, so a requirement to maintain documentation, implement data governance, um, have transparency and human oversight, and also monitoring and reporting of serious incidents. So while these high risk AI systems will be quite heavily regulated, low risk systems uh, are subject to minimal regulations. Uh, providers have to ensure that individuals are made aware that they're interacting with an AI system. Uh, for example, when using things like chat box, chat bots or deep fakes, <clears throat> but otherwise uh, many of the other more detailed regulations don't apply. The latest version of the AI Act um, triggered by tools such as ChatGPT um, has introduced requirements for foundation models, what they call foundation models, which are defined as an AI model that's trained on a broad data on broad data at scale, designed for generality of output, 
and which can be adapted for a wide range of distinctive tasks. Providers of these foundation models are subject to obligations to undertake risk assessments, mitigate foreseeable risks, um, and establish data governance. Um, now, like uh, the GDPR, the breach of the AI Act is also subject to potential substantial fines. In fact, more substantial than under the GDPR. Um, breach of the general prohibition um, would lead to, or could lead to fines of up to 7% of global turnover or 40 million um, euros, whichever is the higher. So very substantial potential penalties under, under that act. Um, so, this is an EU regulation, and it's not going to apply directly to the UK, but providers outside the UK who put their systems on the market in the EU, or if the output of their systems is used in the EU, they will be subject to the regulation by virtue of its extraterritorial effect, similar to GDPR again. Um, meanwhile, in the UK, um, back in September 21, the UK published a national AI strategy setting out a plan for making the UK a global AI superpower. Just uh, in March 23, they launched, uh, the government launched an AI white paper setting out the UK's approach to regulating AI. Different to the EU, the main objective of the UK proposal is to avoid legislation which could stifle stifle innovation. Instead, um, instead of giving a new regulator um, the job of regulating AI, uh, the plan is to empower existing regulators in, in different areas, such as um, the FCA and the ICO, to come up with their own approaches to AI. Again, similar to um, the GDPR, the White paper outlines a number of principles that would apply to the use of AI, um, security, transparency and explainability, fairness, um, accountability and governance, and contestability and redress, giving people a clear route to dispute harmful outcomes or decisions generated by AI. So this is um, very much a, a more light touch regulation compared to the EU act uh, uk looking to position itself as being more accommodating and pro-business uh, as could be seen from the proposed changes to the gdpr um, once this act comes into force there's going to be a two-year period before it takes effect so not something that's happening immediately um, but for those who still bear the scars of the friends who'd run up to the gdpr when a two-year period was also allowed organizations within scope of the um, EU AI Act, AI Act should, would be well advised to monitor progress of the legislation and to begin to look at what they need to do to build compliance into their systems and set up procedures and documentation to, to meet compliance. Um, but the more immediate focus uh, today, if you like, is in ensuring that developers and users of AI systems comply with laws that are in place now. Um, including data protection. So uh, turning therefore now to some specific issues um, for AI under GDPR. Well, GDPR is probably the most engaged regulation. It doesn't specifically refer to AI, uh, but it is technology neutral. Um, of course, GDPR only applies where AI processing involves personal data. So while the GDPR won't apply to, for example, a climate change application, it will apply to a system evaluating applications for jobs or for a loan. So the core data protection principles for uh, AI projects will be the same as for any application. Um, but with AI, there are perhaps a number of particular challenges uh, for achieving compliance. Uh, take transparency, for example, one of the central principles, and data subjects' rights, um, a key ingredient of fairness, um, and also uh, essential for valid consent. Um, under the GDPR, a privacy notice has to include information about the existence of automated decision making, often an element of AI. It has to provide meaningful information about the logic involved, as well as the significance and consequences of the processing. Um, that can be a little bit challenging um, as the logic used in AI systems may be difficult to describe 
in the way required by the GDPR, concise, intelligible, and easily access accessible. Um, complex AI processing um, can be difficult to, uh, to describe in an accessible way. And there's obviously a tension here between the need for information to be concise and understandable on the one hand, and the need for it to be comprehensive um, on the other hand. In this respect, the, the ICO has worked in conjunction with the Alan Turing Institute, and they've published guidance on explaining decisions with uh, made with AI, um, aiming to give some practical guidance on to how to explain how the AI models are working. So worth taking a look at that work if you are designing privacy notices in respect of AI systems. Uh, then uh, to take the example of the data minimization principle, um, this is that data processing should be limited to what is necessary, data minimization. Uh, AI and big data are closely related. AI systems often heavily reliant on large volumes of data in their training and use. So there's a potential risk that processing large data sets could, fly, could um, fail to comply with data minimization. Against this, arguably, minimization doesn't necessarily of itself exclude the use of large data sets, as long as it provides a benefit relative to the purposes of the processing that outweighs the risks um, for the data subjects. Um, accountability, a central theme of the GDPR, um, a number of ways to, de to demonstrate accountability. Um, Data protection impact assessment is one, uh, assessing the risk and working out um, what steps can be taken to mit mitigate that risk. Um, and then looking at this uh, a little more at this rule in relation to automated decision making. Um, AI is a tool that can make decisions by itself. Literally, um, computer says no. Decisions making uh, made by using AI may be either fully automated decisions, or they can be made with a human in the loop. Um, it can be involved in a range of activities, such as credit applications or recruitment. Article 22 of the GDPR effectively outlaws significant decisions being taken by a computer based solely on automated decision making, on automated processing rather. Um, this applies where the decision has legal effects concerning the individual, or similarly significantly affects them. So that's defined as automated decision making in the GDPR. Um, the wording is not terribly clear, but it looks like it is an absolute prohibition on ADM in that context. Raises questions about, well, when is a decision made solely by automated means? And what are legal effects or similar effects? Um, just this month, uh, Uber was found to have violated the rights of three UK-based drivers by firing them on the basis of fraudulent activity picked up by one of its automated decision-making systems. The court found that limited human intervention in, automate, in Uber's automated decision process was not much more than a purely symbolic act. So therefore, there has to be something a little bit more to um, step outside of the automated decision-making. These questions have been referred actually to the um, European Court of Justice recently uh, in a case concerning automated credit scoring, in a case brought by Schufa, um, a German credit information agency, um, providing information on credit worthiness and the like. So um, automated decision making is permitted only in certain limited um, scenarios, for example, where um, you have explicit consent or it's necessary for the purposes of performance of a contract. And where you use ADM, uh, you have to implement some measures to safeguard data subjects' rights and interests. Looking at the um, UK reforms that Claire mentioned, one of the more controversial aspects of this um, are the uh, changes relating to automated decision making. Uh, first of all, the bill provides a new definition of a decision based solely on automated decision uh, processing as one that involves no meaningful human involvement in taking of the decision. So a bit of a subtle difference between solely automated processing and with no meaningful human involvement. More controversially, 
the bill relaxes the prohibition on ADM. So um, ADM will only be prohibited under the UK rules when the decision is based entirely or partly on special categories of personal data. So that's personal data relating, for example, to racial or ethnic origin or health data. Um, again, unless there is explicit consent or contractual necessity. Um, ADM not involving special categories will not be prohibited. Um, however, when decisions are taken using ADM, um, the safeguards under the UK proposal are a little bit expanded, um, include a requirement for controllers to provide information about the decision-making process, putting in place measures to enable data subjects to make representations and to enable the data subject to obtain um, human intervention and contest the decision. So uh, these are proposals. Again, it's not clear what the uh, final bill with, is going to look like uh, on this area, but um, it looks like it's going through. So again, it's a case of uh, let's watch this space and see where we end up. So that's a very uh, rapid look at the uh, regulation of AI and um, some GDPR aspects of AI. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Colvin, who will look at trends in regulation and enforcement and uh, what we can learn from that. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Nigel. And uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, so in this section of the webinar, uh, I'll be looking at regulatory and enforcement trends teasing out some um, learnings. Uh, so it won't be uh, a surprise to anyone that the direction of travel is only in one direction, uh, increasing regulation and action. So looking at the regulatory trends uh, first, uh, generally we're seeing a strengthening of existing privacy laws. So many countries are in introducing new privacy laws uh, modeled around the GDPR. So the GDPR has really become you know, the global standard and the gold standard really for privacy, which is good news if you're already complying with the uh, uh, GDPR and if you operate on an international basis. The US, Japan, India, Brazil have all implemented laws uh, oriented around the GDPR. Uh, and these laws are you know, aimed at providing stronger uh, privacy protections to individuals and trying to give them more control over their personal data. Uh, PECA, which uh, Claire mentioned earlier, uh, we're finally expecting the EU to adopt these uh, regulations. They've been talking about them for the last five years. These are the regulations that are responsible for cookie banners and pop-ups and also the rules around electronic marketing. Uh, they've been around since 2002, so they're now 21 years old, so really due for an update. And that, that should be in force next year, although uh, there will be a grace period. Uh, there is also an increasing focus on regulating emerging technologies. You saw that with Nigel and the AI Act. Um, the GDPR is intended to be technology neutral. Um, so it's very much principle-based. And the idea being that it should be capable of applying to new and evolving technologies. So this potentially is a gap, um, which uh, not surprisingly, the EU uh, is keen to fill um, and we're seeing that, um, you know, specifically with the AI Act, but we're also expecting um, more regulation around areas of uh, spatial recognition and the use of biometrics, uh, which clearly present uh, new privacy challenges. Uh, in response to globalization and the use of technology, uh, regulators are also expanding their laws to uh, apply beyond borders. Uh, historically, there needed to be some form of physical nexus with a country in order to be subject to its laws. That's now not the case. Um, so for example, if you're entirely based in the US as a company, for example, you can be subject to, to UK regulations. And that's the same for UK companies that are doing business um, overseas, particularly where you are collecting data of um, uh, uh, residents in the country that you're doing business. At the same time, uh, uh, there's also been a trend towards data localization. So restricting data transfers out of a country. So Arjun has just outlined the complicated position in the UK and the EU, but there are many other countries that uh, follow a similar approach. So we've got data localization laws in China, in Singapore, in Australia, and Mexico. And I think this trend is going to continue. The, 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 the trend towards globalizing, globalizing laws 
has also meant that regulators in different countries are having to cooperate with each other um, and they're putting in place formal cooperation agreements. And without those agreements, um, it is very difficult for regulators to um, uh, hold companies to a, to a, to account where they don't have any physical presence in a in a country. We saw that with um, Cambridge Analytica and the uh, UK's cooperation with um, the privacy regulator in in in, in, in Canada. Um, we're also seeing formal cooperation agreements between regulators in country, so um, such as between the FCA and the ICO. Uh, so sometimes there's an issue that falls within the jurisdiction of both regulators, they will have a conversation and determine who is best to carry out and lead on the investigation. And they're also share relevant information. So if you make a notification for to one regulator, um, you should assume that uh, where it's relevant to the other regulator, they will also tell them. Next slide, please. So now turning to enforcement trends, so this is where you know regulators and stakeholders, so individuals, consumer organizations, are using their powers and rights. So the big news this week was uh, Meta's 1.2 billion fine, um, which really highlights that um, transfers of data to countries with inadequate privacy laws are, are and, and continues to be an enforcement priority for regulators. I think much has been written on the decision this week and Meta is, I think, in a somewhat unique position, uh, given its profile with regulators over the last few years, and we'll see that when we come to look at some of the fines. Um, and also the nature of data they collect and their, their activity. But I think there are, um, you know, some points worth, um, you know, highlighting. Again, uh, this action is a result of cross-border cooperation between EU regulators. Um, which, which really is an effective counter to um, global technology companies and was something that, that um, um, was really formalized under the, under the GDPR. Um, but there are still individual regulator actions going on in countries like Germany and Spain. So international transfers is still very much on the radar, radar of, of regulators. So um, I think Arjun pointed out, it, it shouldn't be a box ticking exercise. Um, uh, and a case of simply putting in place SECs and then stop there. I think it's really important, I think, as Arjun emphasized, to you know, review data transfers and look at the risk profile. I think that's, that's particularly important coming out of the, um, um, the Facebook decision, and then in implementing appropriate mitigating measures. From um, uh, an EU perspective, there's been a focus on, on, on governance. That's not something that historically has been High on the agenda of, um, of, of regulators and has much generally been seen as a lower priority. Um, but we've started to see regulators um, uh, look at businesses that, that, that don't have a DPO but should have a DPO um, and uh, take appropriate enforcement action against them, but also looking at if they have appointed a DPO, whether it is truly independent. Uh, and an, an independent really means that um, someone that's not involved in decisions around data processing. So, for example, if you've got a DPO in IT or security and they're making decisions around what security measures you have in place, that is a decision around data processing. Uh, and they would not be independent and they would not be permitted to be in a, a DPO. Um, so if you haven't already, um, um, we would recommend looking at firstly whether you need a DPO and two, making sure that the DPO is actually independent. Um, the new information commissioner uh, indicated last year in one of his sort of first speeches on being uh, appointed as the information commissioner that um, he would focus on protecting vulnerable groups, and that would be an enforcement priority for him. And I think that can be seen this year with the 12.7 million fine levelled against TikTok. In essence, uh, this was because there was over, uh, and those those were children, that comes no surprise, there was over a million of uh, uh, children from the UK under the age of 18 that were active on the TikTok platform, but this is contrary to uh, TikTok's uh, terms of service. Um, the data relating to these children was being used without parental consent. Again, that's contrary to um, the UK GDPR, and that there was a lack of sufficient checks to verify age 
Um, and then ultimately, once um, children were on the platform, uh, there was a lack of uh, activity in terms of removing underage children from the platform um, promptly, despite this being um, raised internally and ultimately it was ignored. So that would that would have been an aggravating factor in um, the fine that was levied. So next slide, please. A, a fundamental principle of privacy laws is that you need to be transparent, i.e. tell people what information you're collecting and why you are collecting it. And regulators have been enforcing uh, this principle with vigor. And you can see this with the enforcement actions against uh, Clearview and WhatsApp. In Clearview's case, they were fined 7.5 million by the UK and 20 million euros by the EU. And in essence, they collected 20 billion facial images of people without telling, um, without telling those people. Um, although the, the information was publicly available and they collected those images from social media and other, other public networks, uh, it's still a requirement that you need to tell individuals that um, uh, you have this data and, and why, you, why you're collecting it. Um, say, uh, sorry, WhatsApp, they are part of uh, Facebook, um, was fined a 225 million by the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. Now they did have a privacy notice, they did tell users um, that they collect their data, but ultimately the policy they used was not transparent enough. It was too long, it was unclear, it was not accessible. Uh, so again, a key takeaway is essentially to um, you know, review whether you're meeting the transparency requirements. Absolutely key is having a privacy policy in place, um, but that privacy policy does need to be concise, clear, and accessible for um, individuals. And that's actually quite a high bar to meet. Um, we're also seeing consumers um, and individuals becoming more aware and exercising their privacy rights more frequently. So this has led to uh, compensation claims, complaints to regulators, privacy class actions being taken by consumer groups with varying degrees of success, but that is a trend that is absolutely um, uh, happening at the moment and continuing. Um, I think we continue to see compensation claims arising from issues like um, not getting proper consent for cookie use, uh, for data breaches. Um, and whilst a lot of those claims are quite small, um, um, if it affects uh, multiple people, then ultimately it's a claim that can add up and can be quite significant. And that's without the cost and, of having to deal with them and, and the potential reputational damage. Next slide, please. So a key principle of um, privacy laws um, is that you need to keep personal data secure. So as, as breaches continue to occur at an alarming rate, um, regulators are placing a greater emphasis on enforcing privacy laws to prevent such incidents. Um, and they're looking to really hold organizations to, a, to, to an account. So when you suffer a data breach, ultimately you have to report that to the ICO. And I think you can see from this infograph um, that um, uh, 76 percent of malware incidents have led to a formal investigation 67 percent of ransomware and 55 percent for brute force so a lot of those reports around cyber attacks are actually leading to formal investigations and i think that demonstrates um uh, how cyber attacks are viewed as a key enforcement priority for the for the ico uh, next slide please so very quickly um uh, I think the trend is obvious here. I think since the implementation of the GDPR, we can see a rise in the level of fines. So in 2018, we had a fine of 400K. Uh, and this week, we had a fine of 1.2 billion. Again, I think that is a trend that's going to continue and even more so uh, with the new regulation that's coming out and the level of fines that Nigel mentioned in relation to um, uh, the AI Act. And we're also seeing that in other related technology legislation. Next slide, please. So just very quickly, um, uh, we are seeing some trends in terms of um, uh, fines uh, in the UK, um, fewer monetary penalties. Uh, the ICO has particularly said that he thinks fines are a slow way to find um, certainty. So um, but the likelihood is, and we're seeing this in the data, there's gonna be less fines, but they're gonna be um, higher. And you can see the level of fines recently, TikTok 12.7 million, Clearview 7.5 million. Um, that is 
uh, different, I think, to the approach of the, the, the EU, where the fines are uh, eye-wateringly high. And I think we're starting to see a disparity in terms of the approach of the EU and the, and, 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 and the UK. And some of that can be put down to a difference in market sizes, but I definitely think that that also represents a divergence in enforcement strategy. And I think it's partly the UK trying to um, differentiate itself and look more business friendly um, in a sort of post-Brexit world. But one common theme that is emerging between the UK and the EU is this focus on um, um, emerging and big tech. So Clearview was subject to the UK's highest fine last year. That provides AI um, technology for facial recognition. TikTok is a large social media tech platform. And you can see that the um, EU's fines are all focused on big tech companies. And I think uh, from the ICO's perspective, um, um, John Edwards, he is a well-known critic of big tech. So his approach will uh, likely to align with the approach of EU regulators given that they are also targeting the likes of Meta, Google, uh, and Amazon. So uh, now back to Nigel to close the session. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Colvin. Uh, well, we have covered a lot of ground, uh, but we have reached the end of our time. Uh, so I'd just like to thank my colleagues, Colvin, Arjun, and Claire. And uh, of course, thanks uh, to you for joining us. Uh, we hope you found it helpful. A uh, quick reminder that if you have any questions following today's uh, webinar, please do contact us direct, and we'll be more than happy to respond in the coming days. Thank you again, and wishing you a good day.